powered by Go Goat Sports, and in partnership with TSN, this is Season 3. It is Episode 24 of the Rain Dregs Hockey Podcast, and it is presented by our title sponsor, Canadian Club Whiskey. We've got former Toronto Maple Leaf and current TSN radio broadcaster. In fact, he's on the TV side as well. He does a ton of games, CHL, NHL for TSN. Carlo Kulayakabo is going to join us in Episode 24, Ray. A uh, big day for you. A couple of Italians on here. I'm not going to get a word in edgewise, am I? No, and uh, we'll be discussing a couple of things that Carlo has tweeted out. Um, I don't remember if he thinks gnocchi is a good dish or not, but if he's on the other side of it, he and I are going to have a problem. We're going to have a problem. (laughs) Are there different types of, how do you say it, gnocchi? Gnocchi? No, that's how you would say it. Gnocchi. Gnocchi. There you go. No, it's potato. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's not that... It's not a complicated thing. If you yeah. eat about 60 of them, you've got a gut bomb like you read about. That thing weighs about 400 <laughs> pounds in your belly. You know, you need to get them to send you some, I think it's called bomba or la bomba sauce. A really, really spicy sort of add-on. And I, not, he got me hooked on this probably a year or so ago. I put it on everything. I put that on everything. Really? That's fantastic. Yeah, I'll get them to talk. I'm going to tell you one quick story that maybe nobody cares about, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So okay. uh, when I moved to Brandon to play my 19-year-old year, my mom sends me a care package. Right. It's got some Italian cookies in it. It's got some of her baking stuff. It's got yeah. homemade spaghetti sauce. Just unbelievable. Beautiful. The day The package shows up a day after I leave on a 14-day road trip. I come back. The billet dad... <laughs> He ate it all. Come on. He ate all the sauce. He goes, oh, yeah, I used it on the eggs and everything. I thought it was for all of us. I'm like, what a meathead. I couldn't believe it. Oh, I'm so sour. But it was a good billet otherwise, though, right? Yeah. Oh, he was, they were fine. He just liked my food. Like, leave it alone. I was that's crushed. Awesome. I was 19. And that's why they call it a care package, right? When mom yes. puts something nice together, it's it's born from care, her love for her son, away and will, from home. And Send I'll him tell a slice you, of home. This is how good she mom was. She's an amazing lady. Uh, I tell her the story. <laughs> Five days later, I got a new batch there. So oh, of she course. wasn't fooling they around. Was you know, that's yeah. awesome. All right, you're in a hotel room. You're in Buffalo. You did the Leaf game last night as part of the TSN telecast against the Seattle Kraken. So you've got the Sabres and the Vegas Golden Knights on Thursday. We're recording episode 24 of Rain Dregs here on Wednesday. And normally we'd look at that game and go, all right, well, Vegas is struggling a little bit. You know, Buffalo's a team on the rise. That eh, might not be a bad hockey game. But it's it's close to must-watch, at least the start because it is the return of Jack Eichel with the Vegas Golden Knights to Buffalo. What do you anticipate? What do you expect there? Well, I'm I'm reading some stuff that the fans shouldn't boo Eichel, that other people are surprised that they uh, are going to have a tribute video to him. The Sabres should have a tribute video for him. He played there a long time and was a terrific player for them. And it was messy at the end. It no doubt ended the way neither side probably anticipated. But they should have the video. Yeah. And the fans should boo him. He wanted to leave. Yeah. And you should boo him. And then he should shrug it off and take it as fuel and try to score. I mean, it's always fun scoring in the place you used to play. But like, sure. it's like everybody's trying to tell everybody how to feel. Like, yeah. if you want to boo, boo. If you want to cheer him, cheer him. And if yeah. Jack wants to score two goals, score two goals. But it's... I, I don't know. I just, I read that stuff and I'm like, what are we doing? Like, I know. It's a hockey game, right? It, there's there's bigger things around. It's a hockey game. You want to boo, you've paid your money, go boo. You want to cheer yeah. Jack Eichel and thank him for his years? Cheer him and thank yeah. him. And that's the way it goes. I'm with you. I've never had an issue with any sort of fan interaction or reaction. Uh, I think back of uh, Stevie Sullivan. Remember when oh, Buddy yeah. was, it, it's one of the greatest of all time where he's getting chirped relentlessly. I guess he was with the Blackhawks at the time, right? Right. And did he take the shot or did it, how did it? No, you got to a pucker a stick in the face. And the guy beside the bench was laughing at him (laughs) and pointing at him and going, ha ha, you got cut. And (laughs) shortly after somebody shoots a puck over the glass, what are the odds it hits this doofus right in the side of the head? (laughs) And Sullivan went right over to him and he's like, ah. Give it to him. 
Yeah, it was so good. Well, look, and that was back in the day where, you know, yeah, there were lots of cameras. I mean, it's, you know, games have been televised for a long, long time, but not like today's broadcasts. Right. I mean, you don't miss anything. I mean, we catch everything on video or on microphone. So the fact that all of that was captured so perfectly right. on camera, that's karma, man. That is just good karma right there. And And the guy has to, you know, put the towel on his head and go, yeah, I was giving it to him. And that's the way it was, right? Like. That's the way it should be. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to see the guy get hit in the head, but you're giving it to him. He's giving it to you. You've both been smacked in the face. And yeah, it's the way it is. So I I hope I hope there's energy in the building yeah. tomorrow. And I know there will be, but yeah, I hope there's energy. It's booing is energy, cheering is energy. And yeah. you don't have to like that he left. So you're allowed to boo. And yeah. he left and he's got to, you know, Eichel's got to expect it. And he probably does. For sure, and you just deal with it and move it along. You you think he's really looking forward to getting it behind him? Yes. You just get it over with and move on. Then, as yeah. I mean, did you go through that in your career? N- no. Um, when I left Hartford um, and went, you know, I left. They told me to leave. Uh, <laughs> traded me to the Islanders. I came yeah. back and they, you know, they treated me well. I mean, I had, I had played a long time there, and they had they treated me well when I went back, when I went back with the Islanders, it was a little bit more mixed because I left as a free agent Mm. and went to the Rangers. When I came back to the Rangers, I don't think anybody knew that I was with the Rangers. So nobody cared. And so after that, like there was no animosity anywhere. All right, Ray headlines are presented by our friends at Boston pizza, where kids eat free. The entire month of March, so get in there. There's plenty of time. Hurry in and look at that extraordinary menu at Boston Pizza. Um, thought we'd talk about the Hart Trophy to start headlines this week, Ray, in episode 24, because, you know, it's, it's well, all major awards do conjure up some debate. There's always debate over the Norris Trophy, the Vesna, of course, go down the list. Um, but the Hart and, and what appears to be the final pairing, and this is premature as I say this, with, what, 25 games remaining in the regular season uh, right. or more in certain cases. It, it sure looks and feels like it's Austin Matthews of the Toronto Maple Leafs and Igor Shesterkin from the New York Rangers. Uh, where are you on that debate, by the way, of goaltenders being in contention for the heart? I, I don't love it because they have their own award, which, yeah. of course, a player can't win. Mm-hmm. But the goalie's part of the team, too. And so I, I don't understand, or not I don't understand. I, I don't love it. I, I think the goalie has to be just amazing to be in the conversation yeah. for the heart because they have their own trophy, the Vezina. Mm-hmm. Igor Shosturkin is stopping the puck 94% of the time. It's ridiculous. It is impossible to imagine the Rangers being anywhere near as good as they are Mm -hmm. with somebody else in between the pipes. Right. 94%. It's it's astounding. It's a staggering number. It really is. And I have all the time in the world to listen to the debate. Shesterkin versus Matthews. So, and I get it. I I wouldn't be offended if Igor Shesterkin won the heart, although I tend to agree with you in that and that a player count win the the Vesna trophy. Um, But then you look over at the Toronto Maple Leafs and, you know, maybe, well, you know, the Columbus game on Monday followed by the Seattle game on Tuesday are indicative of the struggles of the Toronto Maple Leafs, which yeah. we'll get into momentarily here. But when you've got the firepower that the Leafs have, with Austin Matthews leading the parade like he did Tuesday with a hat trick against the Seattle Kraken, man, it, 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 it goes beyond cliche to reality in that Toronto seemingly can outscore their mistakes with Austin Matthews playing as confidently as he has. Um, okay, so first, just on the Leafs, yeah, they can outscore their mistakes. It depends who they're playing. Right. Yeah. Right? Like, there's going to, you know, so they outscored their mistakes against Columbus. They outscored their yeah. mistakes against Seattle. It might be a different story against Florida or Tampa. Right. Uh, I think right now, what is it, March the 9th, I think Austin Matthews is the best player in the league. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It, maybe in a month it won't be, but I, I watch him play. He's He is doing things all over the ice that other people can't do. 
Yeah. He's so big and so strong and such a powerful skater. He's got 43 goals. 43. It's, you know, <laughs> like the Leafs record, I think, is 54. And I, I'm i taking the over. Yeah. Feels so, like, you know, it. like I, I just I, I just feel like he's the best player in the league. If I think I'm glad I'm not voting today because I'm not sure who I would vote for, but it would be one of those two guys. Yeah, and it's not an indictment on Austin Matthews no. to, the, for you to say that, because I think you're right. No. Today, he is the best player in the game. But you know what? A lot of nights, Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl are good. They haven't been as good of late. Jonathan, but Uber, they can't be the no. they can't be the most valuable player if in comparison to Matthews. Yeah. No matter what you think about Dreisaitl yeah. and McDavid, how great they are, because their team. Yeah. How how valuable can you be to that team? Yeah. When they're in their spot, I mean, the yeah. answer is their disproportionate importance. But I'm not voting for them. <laughs> like, not not going to happen. Not. Not for this year, for me. I mean, I look at, I look at some of the other um, MVP guys, and I would have Hedman. Mm-hmm. I would have Kucherov. Mm-hmm. I would have Kale McCarr. Mm-hmm. I would have the Edmonton guys in the conversation for sure. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. They're they're not at that level right now. Okay, um, shift over to goaltending. I touched on it yeah. briefly. You know, we talk about Toronto. Uh, just having to muster up more offense to cover up some of the blunders. That's not all on Jack Campbell or Peter Morazic. That's that's on porous team defense. And again, not just isolating, you know, uh, the play of their blue liners and what they do in their defensive zone. But when you look across the league, is there a true goaltending need? Is it Toronto? Is it I mean, it doesn't feel right that Colorado should have to do that. But I mean, or, or is there another team that you just feel, look, you, 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 we look at you by standings and think that you potentially can be a top Stanley Cup contender. I don't see it because of the goaltending. Well, not, not really because of the goaltending. Like the teams that are trying to, you know, if you're looking for a number one goalie now, and that's the only thing you have to add. First of all, who's giving you that upgrade no and what is the cost? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's really hard to fix that position right now. I I think my view on acquiring goalies at the deadline changed a little bit when St. Louis uh, traded for Ryan Miller um, back in the day when he was with Buffalo. And yeah. Miller at the time was one of the game's best. And he went to St. Louis and it was a mess. And he talked about later, um, you know, adjusting to a new conference, uh, playing with a new system, a new style, a new team. And it just didn't work. I think, I think it's harder for a goalie than people might suspect. All right. Uh, an abbreviated version of headlines, because we've got an extended version of discussion with Carlo Coliacfo, pretty good storyteller. So looking forward to having some fun with him. Um, final question in headlines Team that, in your opinion, needs to upgrade at the deadline the most in whatever capacity that is. Is it, you know, Washington kind of mm-hmm. right there, the Boston Bruins again right there. I don't know if it's fair to say Toronto unless, again, you, you, you look at their defensive group and think that they must add something. Um, St. Louis, Colorado, I pick, take your pick of the litter. And I'm, I've, I've isolated the teams that I think – have a strong chance of, of being contending teams. And there are others, but maybe that don't have the same type of question marks beside them, like Tampa Bay or Florida or something like that. But see, I think Florida is going to be one of those teams that upgrades. Yeah. This, but it, through necessity it, or just because they're hungry yeah. and they're looking at Tampa Bay and looking at some other no, teams? No, I think that, I think they would like to and need to um, add a, a decent-sized piece on their blue line. Yeah. Okay. Like to, we're not talking about being a great regular season team and a really good playoff team. They they should have designs on being a deep contender, mm-hmm. and I think they would have to add a guy on the blue line. Um, I'm, I mean, anybody that that loses a you know a top end player off their roster, I mean, you're not filling that spot now either. But Florida's one. Um, I look at St. Louis, and I I keep waiting for them to really put it together. They're built for now, not future. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I could see that they would be really hungry to add, uh, add a piece. Colorado is, 
I mean, they're in on the Giroux thing. We keep hearing about that. But, like, uh, how much more do they need? Right. I, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know that answer. But I think, they, I think they're going to try to add, too. The one thing you've got to always be careful of is you're rolling along. Yep. You want to make your team better. What if you make it worse? And that happens, right? You shake up yep. the chemistry and it goes sideways. And it's it's nobody's fault. It just the guy comes in, he doesn't quite fit. The style doesn't fit the way you might think. Somebody loses ice time, then they can't get their game back. It's it's a tricky deal. All right, those are your headlines brought to you by our friends at Boston Pizza. Our interviews on Ray and Dregs are presented by Canadian Club Whiskey, who are asking, are you over beer? Why not try a refreshing CC ginger ale with lime if you choose next time you're having a drink or you're watching the game? All right, Carlo Koliakovo has been kind enough to join us here in episode 24 of the Ray and Dregs podcast. And uh, this is a bit of a tough one, Ray. Like, do we introduce Carlo as co-host TSN first up morning radio in Toronto sure. or former long time NHL player defenseman or member of team Canada. As we can see, if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, there's the number eight Koliakovo team Canada in the background. Well, I Pick think you've poison. done it all. I think you've yeah, done it all. Got it all, all of those things. Yeah. Carlo, welcome. Thanks boys. Uh, I'm excited to finally be on the rain drags podcast. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> To listen to. Hey, what time uh, did you get started today? What's that? What time did you get started today? Uh, well, my days usually start at 5.30 a.m. My alarm goes off. I hit the snooze button twice. I roll out of bed and I roll down into the basement. <laughs> so, okay. So, eventually that's going to end. No? You're gonna it have... better not. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you... It better not. What time do you... like? How much do you sleep? Like I did morning radio for one year and I was yeah. like, oh my God, I can't yeah, keep doing torture. this. And uh, well, that's the big advantage that I've gained, Dre, from working from home is that I've actually been able to get a lot more sleep and not feel guilty or tired, you know, when I wake up or when I'm done work. Cause you know, when I'm going into studio, it's a four thirty wake up for me. Yeah. And those are tough some mornings, especially when you're up until 1 a.m. Watching you know, catching, games, yeah you know, watching games and stuff like that. And I try to get a bed early before 11, but it's really, really tough sometimes because that's when I'm accumulating all my information, right? Yeah. right? It, you know, to prepare myself for the morning. So um, this transition for me to work from home has actually made me a better broadcaster because I don't feel like I'm, I'm that tired. I've actually have more energy to do more. And I feel like I can be better at my job doing mm-hmm. it because, you know, like I said, my brain's not that tired and I don't feel guilty if I have to stay up till one o'clock in the morning, cause it's be like, okay, you know, for one night, suck it up after the show, I'll take an hour nap. Mm. Now, right? did, have you always been a sports fan? Cause it's not just yeah. all Leafs, right? It's like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta know some other stuff. Have well, you always been into that? As you can see my helmet there. Well, your bills. <laughs> bills stuff, yes, of if, course. if I don't see you jumping onto a table soon, I'm, I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, man, 13 seconds away from me, having live video of getting power bombed through a table because when the bills oh. took that lead against the Kansas city chiefs, I was with my buddies and the table was set up outside oh, for me oh. to get power bombed through. <laughs> now, how then, pissed were you when, why oh. didn't they kick the ball on the ground? Like, what are they doing? Ray, there's, <laughs> you're, it's, you're, you're digging up. Oh, all I love it. here, buddy. <laughs> it, it's I still scarred by it because I still wonder <laughs> if they get past that game, are we talking about them being the Super Bowl champs? Maybe. Yeah. And that 13 seconds will scar me for the rest of my life. Like as long as I can remember being a Bills fan, and believe me, for 20 years there wasn't really anything proud to be a Bills fan because they were miserable. But I can't think of like you talk about wide right. Um, this to me stings even more because you know, just the way they lost. Yeah. Uh, when we when we see the videos of you <laughs> cheering your boys on, like the, when the Bills win again, they win again. You get Josh Allen. Now you're really pumped. You're really into oh, things. Yeah. And I'm like, you would be if I'm assuming your wife is not as big a Bills fan as you. She's learning to be. Oh, the poor woman. She's got to sit there and watch your <laughs> lunacy yeah. through yeah. all of this. Well, here's the thing, Ray. I'm lucky. I've I've got a great wife that's really supportive of. She's been supportive my whole career. She's even more supportive of, of my co- post career. And you talked about how I've been into sports. 
I don't really watch movies. I don't watch TV shows. I've always grown up loving to watch sports. You know, I used to play in a lot of fantasy leagues and, you know, watch a ton of hockey. And, you know, my off time, I just would watch sports. And it's, I'm thankful for that right now because it's helped me found or find a transition into my post career. Mm. But I have a deal with my wife during football seasons that for 18 weeks or eight, sorry, 18 days, all I ask for is one Sunday a week to be left alone and hang out with my buddies. She can, <laughs> she can, t- I, whatever she wants to do for that six days during that week, carte blanche. Well, I do it for her. That one day on Sundays, I want to be with my, cause I can't be around. I, I just, it's, I don't know well, if it's a disease but, in me. But what time does it start? Like, are, are you, are you getting the kids breakfast and then you've got your yes. bills paraphernalia on and you're all in all day? Well, I, I'm not that, that big of a super fan where I wear like the shirts, the hats. Yeah. Every once in a while, I'll throw it on. I like wearing my Josh Allen Jersey, but my day <laughs> normally starts. I get up in the morning, I make the kids breakfast, I make everybody breakfast, I clean up, I do what I got to do. By 12 o'clock, I'm out of the house. Wow. For the day. Just think, there so. was somebody somewhere in your career doing that with a Koliakovo jersey on. <laughs> <laughs> they get up, they watch, they cook the kids breakfast. Hang on, Carlo's on tonight at 7. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's it drags. It's funny you ask that question because... I think there's about four or five weeks in the season where they have those European games. Yeah. Right. Right. So it starts at 9 a.m. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the days. Oh, yeah. It's a tough one. So I love it. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm a diehard fantasy football guy. Uh, I love playing it. I love doing survivor pools. It just keeps me really interested in the game. And as much as I played the game of hockey, the football is the one sport I just love the fall. I wish there was the weeks were longer. I wish there yeah. was like twenty four week season. But now, okay, so you mentioned like the fantasy uh, and this, the fantasy team and the survival pools and yeah. gambling's come huge into hockey here in the oh, last yeah. in the last year. Um, I was surprised they never got to it earlier. Right. Um, like, are you interested in following that stuff? Like I am. Like the. The other day, they they I'm watching a game. They flash up uh, the over under. It was Vegas and somebody or other. They fla- Minnesota. They flash up the over under at five and a half, and yeah. the game was w- the game was three two. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, you could make that bet instantly. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, live betting. And, yeah. And, look, and I'm like, oh my god, a- like somebody's gonna bet on the over. They got it's the a big goalie part of it now. Right. Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely piqued my interest. Like I said, I used to play a lot of fantasy sports back in the day, and that's what sort of intrigued my competitive juices about the sport. I mean, you used to gamble here and there on the odd sport every while, especially football and stuff like that. But if I didn't play fantasy football and I didn't play like in these pools that I do and, you know, maybe get into gambling, you know, moving forward here because, you know, there's, it's everywhere around you. And Mm -hmm. even my sports talk radio, it's sort of the way we're transitioning gambling into sports. I don't know if I would watch the games as intently as I do. To me, it's a source of entertainment. Interesting. Now, did you know you were going to broadcast when you were playing? Like, did you hope to do no. it? Or were you just kind of playing along and when you retire, I'll figure it out then? Well, it's funny you say that because I played two years in Europe to finish my career. And I know your son's yeah. playing in, in Germany and I loved it there. Like the German international hockey experience is it's pretty crazy. Amazing. Yeah. I, almost, I almost say to myself that I wish I would have done it earlier. Mm. But doing it earlier, I wouldn't have been able to play 14 years in the NHL. Mm-hmm. And I always said to myself, as you know, as I transitioned to Europe, like when you go to Europe, you know, it's you're, you're probably not coming back, right? Right. And I said, I want to play as long as my body allows me to play because it's fun playing, and this is all I really know. But in my second year in Europe, there it was the first time in like eight years where I really suffered an injury and I missed time for it, and I really started to think about what I was going to do next. And all I knew was hockey. And, you know, I started to do some skill training with Power Edge Pro and really, really enjoyed that, you know, not just training it myself, but teaching it to the young kids and seeing their development, you know, path sort of accelerate year after year. I always wanted to get into coaching, Hmm. you know, coaching Hmm. at the pro level. I would would have loved to make a lateral move, but even if I had to start somewhere lower and sort of build up to the ranks, I figured I was going to stay in hockey somehow, whether it was through coaching you know, player development, I would have loved to get into management, but never once did I ever think I'd, you know, transition into the media. And to be honest with you, all it took was a phone call from our boy, Jeff O'Neill. I literally 
two days after coming home from Europe, I'm, I'm at the gas station putting gas in my truck and I see a call from, oh, me and oh, with text during the year, you know, I watch them on overdrive in the, in, in, in the States and stuff like that, <laughs> or sorry, in Europe. And he just, he just threw the question at me, got me on the phone. He's like, Hey, so are you retiring yet? And I'm like, nah, I mean, I haven't really thought about it. I Sorry, that play. sounds so much like him. It's Not, really hey, does. how you doing? Just like, yeah. hey, are you retiring yet? Yeah. Like, you look done to yeah. me. Are you, you like officially yeah, retiring? Are you retiring yet? <laughs> and so I didn't really put much thought in it. And I'm like, nah, I haven't thought about it. I don't have a contract next year. I haven't really you know, decided what I want to do, but I'd like to stay in hockey. And he's like, buddy, you got to come do what I do, man. Like, this is, this is the job. I'm like, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, you're basically – in the game of hockey without living the stresses of being a hockey player. Right. And I, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, it's, it sounds pretty cool. Let me see what it's like. And thankfully, you know, Jeff McDonald allowed me to, to experiment with, you know, the positions that were available at, at TSN 1050. And it just took off from there. I just felt like at a time where I didn't really know what I was going to do, I was having so much fun doing what I was doing. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I can make a career out of this. Cause I, I mean, the thing that I missed the most in my career was I didn't really have stability, Mm -hmm. you know, with like, I played on seven teams in my last eight years of my career. So it was like every year was traveling to some somewhere new and packing up and just hoping to get, you know, a year or two in the same spot. And I did that in my last two years in Germany. But when I really started to process this gig at TSN, I'm like, you know what, this could give me some good stability and more than anything, just longevity. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. with you know, in this market, the profile that I carry, playing for the Maple Leafs, having the knowledge that I do about sports, and everything just worked out, man. Hey, uh, tell, I, I think I know part of this story, or, or a lot of it. You're in Germany, uh, your wife's pregnant. You're, oh yeah, you got a you got a playoff series. It's really important, but yeah, it's time for the baby. So, yeah, so the deal when I signed in Germany was. <laughs> I was going to go by myself and my wife was going to stay home and have our baby. But I wanted the team to know that I was going to be home for the birth, regardless of when it was. And the timing of it was right around playoff time. So in Germany, they have the play in uh, series, which me and you, Ray, are yeah. a big fan of. Love it. Right? I think the NHL, I think the NHL should, should do definitely it. implement it. It's exciting for the game and it mm-hmm. keeps the, the, the sort of intrigue near the end, like right until the last game of the season. Yeah. We were in the eighth seed. We won in regulation in the last game of the season to move up to the fifth seed. Right. So we ended up getting into the top six, not having to play in that plan, which was amazing for us because we had a week off. And all I kept saying to myself is, can my wife eat spicy food? Can she do something <laughs> to, to maybe help push the baby to come during that week? Well, that didn't happen. So um, this story is shared in James Duffy's book as well, too. And it's an incredible one because, you know, I, I accomplished something that I never thought in my in my in a million years could ever do. Um, we played game one. It was a, it was a Saturday. It was a Sunday uh, afternoon. Sorry. It was a Monday night. Game two wasn't till Friday. So I said to myself, like we finished as, as the, as the, the fifth seed win the first game so that, um, sorry, we were the second seed that year, win the first game so that, cause it's, it goes one and one, right? Yeah. Win the first game, there's less pressure. Now, if I win the first game, I can plan to go home Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, be back for Friday. So we were up 3-1 three, three, late in the third period. They tie it. They actually go up in the last minute of the game. We tie it with three seconds left to go to overtime. First shift in overtime, we win the game. So I'm like, oh, thank God. We're up one nothing. Now I can go home, no pressure, have the kid, Maybe be back by Friday. If we're not back by Friday, at least the team knows that we're up one nothing going into that series. So get home. Um, get home Wednesday or late Tuesday. Wednesday, no baby. Thursday, um, you know, late at night Thursday, my wife starts getting contractions. We go to the hospital. So I inform my team. I'm like, okay, I'm not going to make game two. My wife's going to have the baby. So the next day in the hospital, it's a six-hour time change. It's a one o'clock game, local time, Easter time, that we're playing game two. And my wife, she's having contractions, but she's not quite there yet. And all I'm saying to myself is, I hope my wife can hold out to at least the game is finished so I can watch the game <laughs> and then watch my son be born. And she did. She hung out. 
But the stresses that were going through me in that game, we were up one nothing, we were up two one, we were up three one, and we lost four three in regulation late uh-huh. in the game. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, no, because if we're up two nothing, I have no pressure. Right. Team's yeah. gonna be like, stay home, enjoy with your family, whatever. I knew, I said to my wife, if we lose this game, they're going to tell me to come back for Sunday's game. So as my, my wife's giving birth, I can just feel my phone just going, <laughs> teeing off in my pocket, like vibrate, vibrate, vibrate. There's literally like 50 messages from my teammates, from my management, asking if, first they're asking me if we had the baby, how we're doing and stuff like that. And so once I respond after my son was born, there was like a good 30 minute, one hour grace period there. I, I finally start to get back to everybody. And they're my coach, my GM. They're calling now. <laughs> so I pick up the phone, tell them what happened. They're like, hey, listen, man, we're so happy for you. But how quickly can you get back <laughs> is the question they ask. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't know. I, I can't really answer this right now. I'm not leaving unless I have my wife's blessing. I said, I'll get back to you guys. Let me, let me have a talk with her. And like I said, my wife was amazing during it. She understood totally. She was really grateful that the team at least allowed me to come home for the birth. And she's like, car it's been a long time since you've been this wanted and when she said that it sunk in so much to me because i was in a team that like for years i wanted to feel wanted you know the guy to help push the team over so i book a flight for saturday afternoon i'm on the flight about to take off the 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 pilot comes on and says uh or the stewardess comes on whoever comes on and says uh, we have a problem with the plane. There's a mechanical problem. We're going to have to ask everybody to board. And I'm like, yes, get to stay. <laughs> Can't go. But as we about to leave, we're in the terminal. They're like, please don't go anywhere because we've got another plane well, waiting. Of course I'm they like, do. Yeah. who the hell has another empty plane just <laughs> waiting there? <laughs> so I had to wait an hour and a half for the next plane to take off. So originally, as I was supposed to get in Sunday morning for a one o'clock game Sunday, I was supposed to get in at 7.30 in the morning, which would have given me a little bit of time. You know what I mean? Go home, shower, have breakfast, stuff yeah. like that. Well, because of the delay, I didn't get in till 10 o'clock. So I get in at 10 o'clock. Our team services guy is meeting us there. Frankfurt from Mannheim is literally a 45-minute drive. He got me there in 15 minutes. Because, you know, in Germany, the Autobahn, <laughs> yeah, yeah. fast lane, you can go as fast as you possibly want. And nobody on my team knew this except for my coach and my GM. So I show up into the dress room. Guys are getting dressed to go onto the ice. And they're like, what the hell are you doing here? And I'm like, guys, as long as I'm here until the game is over, don't ask me that question because I don't want to think about what I just did. I'm here to play a playoff game. I just like literally barely slept, stepped on a plane, six-hour flight, six-hour time change, (laughs) walked off the plane from the airport into a dress room into a playoff game. Oh, boy. <laughs> I haven't even skated all week. <laughs> so, <laughs> How'd you play? You think about how How'd bad you play? I felt. Ray, I, w- I scored the game-winning goal and was the first star of the oh, game. Oh, come so on. Good. <laughs> yes. Hey, doesn't, it so, make, doesn't that make you think all this bullshit about we're sitting around taking naps and yeah. eating the food? You ate airplane food i'm sure it was delicious Dude, i barely ate i had a stomach ache on the plane i spent most of it in the bathroom <laughs> <laughs> so think about it zero sleep no food purely on adrenaline i play this oh, game so and it was the best feeling i could ever That's have awesome after everything that i just went through it's but as karma. soon as i hit my stall in the locker room after the game i literally couldn't move Like the exhaustion that my body just went through is like, I went home that night. We had a day off the next day. I literally slept until dinner time the next day. Right. Uh, Like that's how burnt out I was. But it's like you said, Ray, you know, you reflect back on your career. And I used to be a huge pregame nap guy early on in my career. Like it had to be three hours to the point I was doing it so much that I was like, man, like I'm wasting so much time sleeping, (laughs) you know, during the, during these game days. I barely slept. I would take like 20, excuse me, 30 minute power naps later on in my career. But it goes to show you that how mental, you know, the game is when you're talking about preparation, stuff like that, because you're so routined, but really, you know, you could put anything, you could do anything you put your mind to, Mm -hmm. if you really wanted to do it. And that was something, like I said, I could have never thought I could imagine to do. I did it. And that's something I can always say I did and felt good about it. It's oh, awesome. Yeah. We, uh, we've got trade deadline coming up. Obviously, we're all working feverishly both prior to and in the day of March 21st. Well, you, you are. Have a, 
Well, you, know, you are. <laughs> um, Drags, I've told you year after year since I started to work with you. I admire you and everybody else that works in your position because the job you guys do is absolutely. You guys should do a Netflix series one year. No, we shouldn't. Of the do life that, of no. an insider, man. I, I I say the same thing every year. I've said it for twenty years. It takes me eleven months to repair the damage that I do in the one month <laughs> leading up to the trade deadline because I'm just constantly peppering people. Right? Yeah. So, uh, you have a crazy trade deadline story. Maybe it doesn't involve you, but I mean, you played on so many teams. Yeah. There must be one or two wild ones. So the one that, that sort of always sticks out in my head was my second year in St. Louis, where my first year in St. Louis, I wasn't a trade deadline deal. I was there early in the season. But we went on this incredible run after the trade deadline to make the – actually, it was actually after the All-Star break to make the playoffs. And so we get into the playoffs. We get swept by Vancouver. And now the hype – in St. Louis starts to turn the following season. There's the mm -hmm. expectation of us taking that next step, being a playoff competitor. Well, we went the complete opposite way. And next thing you know, they're talking about breaking up the, the core. And Keith Kachuk was one of the, you know, the core guys on that team, veteran guy. And he was heavily sought after at the deadline. And I remember that there was a deal to Boston to him, like right at the last hour of the deadline. And apparently the facts didn't go through. This was back in the day. Yeah, with the yeah. machine. Yeah. So we were lucky because he ended up sticking around, you know, it was a guy that, you know, we didn't want to see leave and cause he meant so much to our younger players and so much to the team. And that was a trade that, you know, he probably, you know, is thankful that never happened either because of, you know, the, the way he was able to retire and, and set yeah. up shop in St. Louis. My own personal experience, um, it was the year after in St. Louis where, again, you know, we didn't meet expectations and there was a lot of rumblings around my name. I probably should have, you know, been closer to you back in those days because I probably could have, you could have got, I probably could have had you get me traded <laughs> with all your sources. Yeah, great. But we went on a, we went on a one day road trip and my biggest pet peeve during playing is I hated playing on trade deadline day. I think, yeah. I don't think there should be any games played on trade deadline day because everybody's tuning in to what's going on in the league. Mm. And really you can't pay attention. You, there's no other way, no other way you can't pay attention. Like during that time, we didn't have Twitter and we didn't have phones accessible to us. It was just us watching it on TV. Everybody wanted to watch trade center. And me and Brad boys were roommates at the time. And it was so funny when we boarded St. Louis to go to the city that we were in, I think it was Minnesota. It's a one day trip and I've got two suitcases with me. A lot of confidence. And everyone's eh? like, <laughs> and everyone's like uh, you packing heavy for the one day trip? And I'm like, well, you never know what's going to happen. I may not be coming back on this flight because I expected to get traded. I had two suitcases with me and so did Brad Boys, right? Because they were both in the rumor mill. And I remember that day. We didn't play that day. Uh, sorry, we did play that day. And all afternoon, me and Brad Boys didn't sleep. All we were doing was just messaging our agents, you know, watching the TV to see if we were traded. And then when the day, the day or when the deadline passed, me and him go down into the meal room and everyone's surprised to see us. And then while we're in the meal room, somebody comes in. I don't remember who it was. It must've been the assistant GM and pulls Eric Brewer aside. And Brewer is having his meal and stuff like that because he had to sign his no trade clause because he just got traded to Tampa Bay. And all I kept saying to myself is, God, man, they couldn't put me in that deal to Tampa Bay. <laughs> like, like, you know, a place to be traded to at the deadline. Tam like, and Tampa Bay went to the cup final that year wow. when they made that trade. That That's so much stress around that day. I, I remember one, oh, one day uh, I'm playing for Hartford and Dave Babich, who was a terrific player. There's lots mm. of rumors around Babs at this time. So we're at morning skate. We play that night. And the deadline was noon Eastern for some reason. Yeah. And it clicks over, you know, the little time of day clock in the arena. It's at one of the ends there in, in all the rinks. It clicks over to 1201 and Babs yells, you can't get me now. <laughs> it was so funny just to think like everybody was yeah. like, you're looking at it like, Okay, nobody's coming out. This is good. Right. I don't want, you know, who wants nowadays you can't see that because we still see trades that come in after the oh, six yeah. o'clock. Right, yeah. right. Well, so. it's it's a it's a crazy time of year. Now, when you played, um, were you like 
you're a fun guy and you like to yuck it up and stuff. Were you a, yeah. uh, were you a prank player or were you? Oh yeah. I loved playing. See, I, I love that stuff. Too. And it Ray, was easier, love... older. It way, way back in the day, it was easier. There was, you had to hang around more. So there was yeah. more opportunity. That's what I thought oh, yeah. anyway. So I got two stories for you. One in my rookie year in a Maple Leafs dressing room, I was sitting beside Ty Domi between Ty Domi and Brian McCabe. Yeah. And Brian McKay pulls me aside and he goes, hey, go cut Ty Domi's laces. <laughs> and I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, just go do it. Don't worry. We'll protect you. We won't we'll make sure nobody finds out it's you. I was like, dude, he's going to kill me if he finds out if it's me. <laughs> like, I don't want to put myself in that situation. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. So they found a way to keep him out of the room. I go and just cut his lace. Right. And... Now I'm sitting in my stall and I just, I, I've got, you know, the feeling in your stomach, that pit in your stomach just, yeah, you shouldn't have and you're that. sweating, you got the, you know, the sweats and stuff like that. And I'm thinking to myself, what's he going to do when he finds out his skates are tight? Like he's going to make a big scene. His first thing he's going to do is look at me. He's going to say like, Hey, who did this? And I like, how am I going to keep a straight face if he's asking me who did it? So he was very, very like quiet about it. He saw his lace and he just chuckled and he walked out of the room and he asked the trainer to get him a new lace. And then he came into the room and he just started scouring the room to see who he could think it was. And I'm looking at the corner of my eye. I'm like, oh, God, please don't look at me. Please don't look. And Caber is just laughing. <laughs> right? So Caber is laughing. He doesn't end up finding out who it is. And Ty, you know, when you get on the ice, you're skating around. He's just skating around to everybody quietly. He's like, who cut my lace? Who cut my lace? Who cut my lace? <laughs> Finally, he comes up to me and he asked me to cut my lace. I'm like, I don't know, man. I didn't see it. Like, I don't know. He goes, you know, and you better tell me. I was like, Ty, I don't know, man. Like, I just, I, I don't know who did it. <laughs> he goes, come over here in the corner. He pulled me aside. He goes, who did it? And I go, Ty, I wasn't supposed to say anything, but I was forced to do it. He goes, thank you. Because he knows who did it, right? He ended up finding out it was Caber that told him that did it. And I said, Ty, please don't do anything to me, man. Like, <laughs> I'm a rookie. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't want to be beat up by, you know, he goes, no, 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 no. Just don't ever do anything to me again. I was like, okay, you got my word. I won't do anything to you again. The second story. Hang on. Did you keep it? Your word? My word, what? That never do anything to him again? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, never, man. Oh, it was a green light. You had a green light. You could have... Yeah, never, man. Oh, you could have said, I gave you my word. You're, you're right. But Ty is such a great human being because for my first NHL game, he called me in the middle of my pregame nap and he goes, hey, uh, you're yeah, you playing tonight? I said, yeah. He goes, call your family. I'm giving you the box, my box oh, for the awesome. game tonight. Bring 20 members of your family. So wow. to this day, that was like the greatest gift I ever received playing the game of hockey is that 20 people, wow. 20 plus family members uh, come to watch my game. So the tie was amazing. Ray, you're going to really appreciate this story because <laughs> I know how much you love traveling. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so it was Christmas break in 2000 and I believe it was 2010, 2011. You know how you play a game and then you got your three day, four day break. Right. So our last game was in Phoenix and because we only had three days, guys didn't really go anywhere. Guys just came back to St. Louis and spent time in St. Louis. Well, there was one guy on our team that was catching a flight from Phoenix after the game to wherever his destination was. So me and two other guys weren't playing that day. And we're like, man, we got to do something to his luggage. So one of the guys I was with uh, goes to the sex store in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> And mean, buys, why a bunch of, yeah. buys a bunch of sex objects. Of course. As you can imagine. Yeah. Comes to the rink <laughs> as he's on the ice for the game, stuffs his suitcase with this bunch of sex toys. But the key is put a full water bottle in his oh, suitcase. Oh, that is really good. <laughs> Got to open it so up. Buried, buried the, the water bottle so that when he gets to security and people have to open it, they're digging. So... After the game's over, luckily we won that game oh, because, you no. know, guys were in a good mood. He gets to the airport that night and the whole time on the bus, people like the guys in the back of the bus are just dying of laughter, just envisioning the scene of what's about to transpire because having a water bottle in your, in your carry on, mm -hmm. you put it through the x-ray machine, you get pulled over for it. Yeah. Automatic. So <laughs> we get a call 15 minutes into the bus ride. 
and it's Matt D'Agostini who we played the trick on. He calls, he goes, you idiots. Oh my God. I was so embarrassed. I can't believe what just happened. Well, you can just envision the person pulling him over, <laughs> opening up the suitcase and being like this, like, what's this? What's this? Was this to get the water bottle? <laughs> Oh, that's so good. Uh, and all we could vision, all we all we kept saying is, I hope we know we can find somebody who has that, that video. Um, security camera video oh, yeah. just to see his expression when he's like this. You think, oh my god, how did this get in my bag? This is not my bag. So good. <laughs> so let's just hope Gord Miller never plays a trick on you. No, it, it, he uh-huh. wouldn't because there is there is one thing that I I like the back and forth, but you're in it to win. Yeah. So if he does that, he will never oh. sleep again. <laughs> he will never, ever, ever. That's a game he doesn't want to start. Yeah. <laughs> now, the one guy, I got to tell you, Carlo, you haven't traveled with him yet. The one guy you don't want to screw around with is Drager. Really? Oh, no. He, he the prankster? Vicious. On occasion. On vicious, nice. though. Like, I love that. He will, he will, turn, things, he will turn things to 11 in a hurry. I love that. I love that. That's the beauty, man. And look, as long as you can do things ah, yeah. that can create a chuckle and not get into trouble doing it. Yeah. Do you know, do you know what I That's used to? Fun. You know what I used to love to do was, you know, when you go to check in at the hotel. Now the guys they all have their keys out on a table yeah. out on the side. We all had to go individually to check in, and so you had, you know, the I call them the cattle ropes. You know, they got the ropes in the yeah, yeah, in the yeah. hotel lobbies. So I'd like to. I would go. And if you could just find the rope at the right spot, you unhook it. And then you hook it really gently onto the guy's bag as he's standing there. <laughs> carrying it with <laughs> And then he walks far enough that he pulls it over. And they're all tied together. Oh. And it's just the racket it makes, bang, 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 bang. And the guy's standing there. Yeah. And you just, you're watching it like a six-year-old. It's the funniest thing yeah. you've ever seen. Oh, I just, I love doing that. Well, stuff. it's funny you mentioned the keys because... The other prank that guys would play is the rush to get off the bus and steal guys' keys. Right. So that they would actually have to go and check in and waste time yeah. doing so. Nobody wants to and, do that. Right. Nobody wants to do that. Everyone just wants to grab their keys and go up. But some guys, there was an incident once where it was in Toronto. And it was, you know, the jo- same jokesters that I just mentioned where they went and stole Cabriolet's keys. Uh-oh. And while Cabriolet was out for dinner, they went into his room and they literally took every piece of furniture in his room and stuffed it in the bathroom. Oh, they went in the bathroom with it. <laughs> and they put his bed in the hallway, <laughs> set up his bed in the hallway. <laughs> so he goes into his room, he opens up, he's like, what the hell just happened in here? Obviously, he goes to get a new key, but... Well, okay, so they Jeff Odgers, one of the great teammates of all time... Chris yeah. Tamer and Sean Donovan, these three idiots in, in my last weekend in Atlanta were out for lunch in uh, Long Island, turned into a longer lunch. Um, yeah. I get back to my room, I open the door, and the first thing that hits me is this wave of heat. My room is about a thousand degrees. They've turned the heat up so high. I look, I look, I take a step in, and everything in the room is on my bed. Oh, man. so they've lifted like that dresser, that big dresser that's always yeah. there, the lights, everything. I look in the bathroom, nothing, not a bar of soap, nothing in there. <laughs> so I look and I'm like, what? So I, I, I'm like, they didn't not just do this. So I'm like, they did yeah. something else. So I flush the toilet and they'd taken the little, um, uh, tube that goes into the bigger tube in the oh. tank <laughs> and they had it pointing out. So if I was sitting on the toilet, it would have hit me right in the back. <laughs> and I was like, yo, I was so mad. Because now, how am I going to – I was sweating getting this yeah. stuff off my bed. I miss oh, that yeah. stuff. I just, I, uh, I love that's it. That's what I miss, man. It's it's just the, the unexpected things yeah. that you walk into or you hear other guys do to yeah. other guys, man. The, the team camaraderie is what I really miss about the game. Fantastic. So last question for me. Leafs, what are they doing at the deadline? You're a big Leaf guy. What do we yeah. got? Goalie, defenseman? Yeah, look – I think I've been pretty vocal about how I feel about the goaltenders. I'm not really too concerned about them because this is what I expected when they went with the tandem. Right. I think the Maple Leafs got elite level goaltending early on in the season that mm-hmm. covered up a lot of the deficiencies we're seeing defensively right now. 
I don't see a guy out there that they could potentially bring in in net that is going to be an upgrade over the two guys that they have. So if I'm the Leafs, you you put a lot of focus and attention on upgrading the blue line. Look, I, I've said this to you, Dregs. If they can find a way to get Jacob Chikorin, whatever it costs, mm-hmm. I, I would make that trade just because of what he brings. He brings offense, defense, toughness, you know, great skater, and cost certainty for the next mm-hmm. three years. Right. And if you're in a win now mode, you know, that's the guy you go after if, if, if I, if I'm them, but I understand there's a cap that's involved. I just think that, you know, to, to lose focus on what the real weakness of this team is because mm-hmm. goaltending is struggling would be a mistake for them. Cause all you got to do is look at Freddie Anderson in the year that he's having in Carolina. It's the first time in his career over the last five years that he's played in front of a defense that plays defense and yeah. he's doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. you cover up a lot of the holes that the defense, you know, has right now, whether it's one guy, two guy, you, yeah. you focus on playing better in front of them. And next thing you know, your goalies are playing better. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. hard to fix all the problems this late in the year. Like, right. I don't mean the Leafs. I mean, anybody, like anybody, you can't, you can't fix three things. You just no. do the best no. you can and hope it fits at the right time. Yeah. And and look, I mean, just they're exciting as hell to watch regardless of what, you know, For sure. that's a tough thing. That's the tough thing about assessing this Maple Leafs team is everybody says, well, yeah, wait till playoff time. Wait till playoff time. I get wait till playoff time, but you still got to appreciate yep. some of the great things we're seeing with this group. I mean, Austin Matthews has been must-watch TV. Yeah. yeah. I think he's yeah, the best player in the league right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'd say yeah. the world. <laughs> Amazing. Right yeah. now. All right, Carlo. Well, we'll let you go with that. Um, well, number one, you got to get some rest you've got a busy day you've got overdrive yeah you've got players lunch only meetings you oh interesting <laughs> yeah i'll be on uh i'm on at five. Oh, so don't you guys <laughs> screw this you the question don't right? don't <laughs> screw this up the the key part of this is o'neill is the host yeah is he really yeah. so oh, wow. do you think i'm gonna make that segment easy no chance oh, no I chance i'm gonna pump Hayes's <laughs> tires if you don't listen to Overdrive, Brian Hayes is the host. I'm going to pump Hayes' tires about what a great host he is every time O <laughs> asks a question, just to rattle. That's where I'm going. <laughs> That's hilarious. I'll be watching. I'll be listening. Yeah. All right, Carlo. Thanks for doing this, man. We really Anytime, appreciate boys. it. And awesome. Uh, thanks, Carlo. Boys. Can't wait to join you for first up. You got it, man. Oh, very exciting moment in the rain, Drake's. Podcast, uh, podcast episode 24. It's that moment, Ray, where we raise a glass of 44-year-old CC mm. to Carlo Kolyakovo. Thank you, Carlo, for joining us today, presented by our pals at Clay- Canadian Club Whiskey. That 44-year-old release now available everywhere across North America. So uh, looking forward to it. And yeah, I just got my to- delivery the other day. Yes, you did. I'm very, you? very excited. You know, it's in the red box too. The packaging yes, it's a good is impressive. Look. Yeah. I, I yes. haven't even. I'm like I said. I, I'm a. I'm not afraid to open the box and look at the bottle. I'm just. I, I want to leave it untainted. I just want to leave it on the bookshelf. I come That's in. Okay I for admire now. it. Yeah, for now. Yeah, for it's now. Okay. For now. There'll be a ton. We will raise a glass in the very near mm-hmm. future. We gotta have Carlo coming back. Uh, oh yeah. Another point in some four episodes. Uh, four season three wraps up entirely because man. We didn't even, we were going to talk about Ken Hitchcock and some of the coaches that Carlo has played with because he's got so many terrific stories, but he, uh, he's just so full of life, isn't he? Right. And, and has had some great experiences, both playing and now doing what he's doing at TSN. Uh, his enthusiasm just jumps at him when he jumps at you when he's on the radio or on TV. He just loves the game and tells us about how much he loves sports and the football pools and all that stuff that he's doing. And, just an awesome guy to have, you know, to, to sit and chat with and loves, loves the game. And I love that he's into the pranks because oh, it's just so fun. How many ex Leaf guys have told a story that involves Ty Domi? Well, 101%. Everybody. Everybody. But you could invent, like, Carlo's not a small man. Ty yeah. was an enforcer. Yeah, Ty was a yeah. good hockey player too. But, you know, for Ty to skate over to Carlo, and say, 
I know something's up. (laughs) You come clean here, young fella. Let's get this on record. I could just visualize that. And then you followed up and said, well, yeah, but that's the green light. And Carla was like, no, no, I stay away from him. (laughs) Yeah, to me, to me, that was like, that would have been, you could have really done something sneaky under the radar then. All right, let's uh, move over to CoolBet.co. Chris Abbott, uh, not able to join us. Normally joins us at this time on the Rain Riggs Hockey Podcast. But he did forward over some ideas, some things that we should talk about, right? Uh, Let's take a look at the Stanley Cup odds. I don't think that we've done that recently on the podcast. The Colorado Avalanche, not a big shocker to me. They're plus 400 right now. I guess a bit of, of a surprise is that the Tampa Lightning are plus 800 as is the Florida Panthers. And then you've got the Leafs at plus 900. There's a, there's a decent gap there between Colorado and Tampa Bay and Florida that I'm not too sure of right now. Well, I, I would not go by Tampa. They're, they're like this old war horse. Now they're seasoned. They've got the best goalie. Yeah. They've got an excellent defense led by a monster and headman. They score like, We'll see if they can pull another rabbit out of their hat at the deadline. Like they always seem to be able to find a way, but they're a good team. Uh, Colorado just, I, I, it's the same. Look, I tweeted out today about Matthews. I, you know, he's just how good he is and how he scores. And people are like, yeah, well, he hasn't done it in the playoffs. You can't score in the playoffs today. No. The playoffs start in May. Right. So if it doesn't work in May, go ahead and criticize it then. But now you can't in my opinion. So Colorado's that same way. Like they're, man, they steamroll people. Is it going to be the same in May? I don't know. Yeah. But it seems like there's a crack maybe that you could, you know, is their goaltending going to be good enough? Is it, I don't know. And you won't know until you get there. Yeah. Is there a flyer team that you would take? Um, like I've got, you know, Carolina right now at plus 1100. The Vegas Golden Knights, man, they've been so hot and cold, plus 1100. And then it dips down to Pittsburgh at plus 16, Boston plus 2,000, uh, Minnesota plus tw- uh, 2,300, the New York Rangers plus 3,000. And I think the Rangers are going to be an active team between now and the trade mm-hmm. deadline. Is there a sleeper in that in, in that group? Well, I don't believe they're the best team of that group, but I'll say Vegas. And the reason is I think that Western road is a lot smoother than the East. Mm. Um, in the East, I think Carolina is really good. Yeah. If they can find yeah. another D, another another real player, I th- I think they could be really good. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, check out some of the Super Bowl odds. Uh, you've got the Buffalo Bills. Carlo would have loved this, right? Plus 800 right now to win the Super Bowl. Kansas City Chiefs, plus 850. The Green Bay Packers, plus 1100. I wonder if that was adjusted with Aaron Rodgers coming out and uh, at least admitting that he's going to be back in Green Bay. He refuted the report that states that it's a four-year extension at $200 million with $153 million <laughs> in guaranteed money. Um, so we'll have to wait for the official contract details, but that's, uh, that's, that's a nice extension for the Green Bay Packers because they look to be a championship team, whether it's a Super Bowl or not conference, perhaps, I don't know. Look, there's been a lot of years of, there's a lot of years of MVP and great numbers and no playoff success. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be the only debate of it. I mean, the the guy can still play, man. Yeah. You're not a Seahawks fan, are you? No, back a hundred years ago when Jim Zorn was the quarterback, I was, but I, I, I never got into the The new wave Seahawks, not as much. So a buddy of mine, businessman, um, busy during the day, right? And and so he didn't, he's not on social media. He didn't know that Russell Wilson had been traded to the Denver Broncos. Oh boy. So we're in his group chat on Tuesday and I sent him this text. I'm like, uh, hey, Alex, are you okay? Do we need to send some assistance? Are you going to be okay? And he went from... I didn't see it to, well, you know what? If he doesn't want to be here, then we don't want him. <laughs> like, like, isn't that just such a typical fan? Like he's oh, not, yeah. He hasn't even looked at the pieces of the transaction and who the, the Seattle Seahawks are getting back. He's so pissed off. He's like, well, if he didn't want to be here, well, then he can just leave. 
<laughs> that's the emotion of okay. that's the emotionality of the fan for sure, right? Like, <laughs> and to heck with it, and let's get someone new in here that wants to be here. <laughs> And we'll get Chris Abbott back for episode 25. Thank you to coolbet.co. It's time for Ask Rain Dregs Anything. You can send us your questions on Twitter and Instagram at Rain Dregs or on the website, randregs.com. Presented by our buddies at Endy. We both love our Endy mattresses. We have for quite some time. They're comfortable, as comfortable today as they were day one. Fast, free shipping and a 100 night trial. Use code RD75 and you will get $75 off a mattress compliments of Endy. Check them out at endy.ca. Instagram, Ray, from uh, Ryan Matheson. Um, what would be a good age? You've got to put your coach development coach hat on for a moment, okay? okay. Ryan is asking, what would be a good age for young players to start looking at game video to improve their play? And I will tell you this, Mason Dreger hated, hated looking at video. And I'm sure it's because he didn't like looking at his own mistakes. Right? Yeah. Um, 15. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like 16, like, you know, when you get to around junior age, when you can maybe, maybe learn to handle some constructive criticism. The other thing is if you're just watching the game, you're not getting anything out of watching game tape. And no. the second part of that is, Whoever you're watching the game tape with, if they don't know what the hell they're talking about either. That's a bigger you're problem. Getting, you're, it's a big problem. <laughs> so uh, not too soon, not early, not, not seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, just go play, have fun, develop yeah. your skills. Yeah. And if it's mom, dad, grandpa, or grandma who are initiating the video replay, never is a good time. <laughs> no, that's, How's that? that would be correct. <laughs> All right, uh, from BTD09, what purpose does a trapezoid have anymore? And can we just get rid of it and once again allow goaltenders to be more active? Well, the trapezoid's positioning is that you don't have a Marty Brodeur run out and kill every four check because he gets out there and passes it better than, than half the defensemen in the league. Yeah. Here's my thought on the trapezoid. It was as soon as it came in, they've got the thing backwards. I think the trapezoid should be smaller and the goalie cannot go into the trapezoid behind the net to stop a dump in. Hmm. So you can basically yeah. pass it from corner to corner from outside the blue line. That changes your attack on the four check. It, it will create some chaos. The goalie uh, wants to go play it in the corner. Mm -hmm. Let him go out there and play it. He's going yeah. to turn it over half as much as you think anyway. I I don't think it should be – I think it could still be there and be beneficial, but they've got it backwards. All right, final question. On Ask Ray and Dregs anything from Ella on Twitter. And look, Ray, we, we both have friends who are in the hockey equipment manufacturing business, right? Mm -hmm doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you played a long, long time. Your sons have come through all of that. I, I feel like this is an interesting and, and important question for Mella. How can hockey become more inclusive when equipment remains so expensive? And man, One that's, the, that's a hurdle. It really is. It, it's a, an enormous hurdle uh, to include people that aren't wealthy from playing. Mm -hmm. So as I see it, one of the great traps is your eight-year-old needs new elbow pads. So you go buy him new elbow pads. What do you need to buy him new elbow pads for? Yeah. I think each organization, um, best as they can, should have a swap meet at the start of the year. We used to have them as kids, but you don't have to buy brand new shin pads. No. Because here's what happens. An eight-year-old gets a pair of shin pads. And by the time he's nine or she's nine, they've outgrown the shin pads. Yeah. They're, they're barely touched. Th that to me in a more connected network is the way is part of the way that you can have more people, more inclusion in the game, in what is a, a realistic hurdle and a real hurdle to the game. Yeah. You know, when I was, uh, I spent time on the board of Whitby and minor hockey here in Ontario, that was arguably my favorite day of the year was that full equipment giveaway, right? We'd have donated equipment just strewn all over a lawn near one of the McKinney arena, near one of the arenas. And nothing made me happier than a young family 
arriving on scene and you find him a gently used pair of skates and oh there's the pants and there's the gloves and then you know what now all of a sudden they you know they, they go down the street and they buy a 30 dollar hockey stick and and they're good to go the only thing we didn't give away of course were helmets and yeah. there's a safety element to that right you just need to be but, sure but there's the other know. there's the other thing i would say to parents don't fall into the trap that your son, daughter needs a $200 hockey stick. Oh, I they did. do not. Brutal. No, but they do not. They can, they can play, learn, love the game with something different than new. Yeah. And if that gets you in the door to play and these, these avenues are open to, for equipment, I think it can be a lot more accessible without without underestimating the real challenge of it. No. Ask Rain Drake's anything. That's a great question by Ella. It is. Right? Yep. Just conjures up an important discussion. Reminder to check out Rain Drake's social channels, for Rapid Fire, presented by Kintech Footwear and Orthotics, keeping you active on your feet for life. A little later this week, we'll have another Rapid Fire on the way with our good friend, Gord Miller. So you do not want to miss that. Ray, you've been patient you put in another yeoman's effort here on the oh, podcast yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. from a hotel room in Buffalo. Yes. Time what? to go eat. Uh, yeah. Time to get an early dinner. I got to be on overdrive at five o'clock to yeah. the players thing because Hayes, the host, is on vacation. Mm -hmm. So between Carlo and Jeff O'Neill and Jamie McLennan, uh, I'm going to dive into the middle of that and try and stir it up a little bit. And those guys always hope, Noodles and the O-Dog, always hope that something big happens while Hayes is away, right? Just yes. because it drives Brian crazy. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't matter. It could be golf. It could be the Raptors. It could be the Leafs. It could be Well, anything. right now it's Aaron Rodgers. They're they're <laughs> mocking him about Aaron Rodgers. Well, he's Rogers. a huge Packers fan. Yes, so, he is. Yeah, yep. that would not sit. Well, but I, I did see an Instagram post from Brian and his family. Uh, looks like they're enjoying some quality vacation. Downtime. Good for them. So good, good for them. them. All right. Uh, aside from the games this week, how's the weather in Vancouver? Are you golfing? It's, or are we? Uh, oh, it's it's What's golf happening? weather. No, no, it's golf oh. weather. We're we're around the corner there. It's we think anyway. But um, yeah, I'll be back Sunday. I'll probably hit balls Monday. I just received a dozen new Titleist golf balls, so perhaps okay. you have some waiting for you as well. Well, that would be nice. That'll get you through three rounds. <laughs> me, me and I know you got to go, but me and a few buddies have decided that we are going to, uh, is it, I guess, monogram, put put some sort of nickname on our golf yeah, balls. Yeah. And then at the end of the year, have like a $50 each bet to see how many balls come back with our names right. on it. Right. So well, I read this great, or I saw this great story. I think it's Jimmy Kimmel and Justin Timberlake are buddies. And, uh, Timberlake gave Kimmel a bunch of golf balls with his with his uh, a return address on them, <laughs> and people were finding them like <laughs> wherever he hit somewhere. <laughs> so good, that's awesome. I love All it. right, buddy, thanks for another great week. Uh, yep. Get back to Vancouver safely, and if you're allowed and able to do so, hit them straight. Yeah, I will give it a go, Drakes. Thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for listening. Enjoy the week. Huge shout out to our partners who make the podcast possible. Our title sponsor and good friends at Canadian Club Whiskey. Thank you. Always asking, are you over beer? Coolbet.co, the free-to-play sports and casino games website by Andy.ca. Remember, use code RD75 to save $75 on a mattress. By Kintech Footwear and Orthotics. Book a consultation at Kintech.net. And by Boston Pizza. Pick it up or get it delivered to your door. Let Boston Pizza do the cooking tonight. And by Doer, use code RND to save 15% off pants at doer.ca. That has been Ray and Drake's episode 24. Look forward to episode 25 dropping in the near future.